In the summer of 1864, Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia was engaged with Benjamin Butler's Army of the James and George Meade's Army of the Potomac, under the unified command of Ulysses S. Grant, in bitter trench warfare. It was the first month of what would become a nine-month-long siege of the city of Petersburg. The front extended over twenty miles, starting at White Oak Swamp to the north and stretching southward across the James and Appomattox rivers towards the outskirts of the city of Petersburg. In June of 1864, Grant's overall command had seen success in breaking through the defensive works around Petersburg, known as the Dimmock Line, during the Second Battle of Petersburg. However, by late June, it became abundantly clear that any further frontal assaults would be too costly. Compelling Grant to prepare the Army of the Potomac and the Army of the James for a long, grueling siege. However, for some of the forces of the Army of the Potomac, they were not content with staying idle while enduring the ceaseless firing of siege mortars and the prevalent threat of Confederate sharpshooters. The men of the Ninth Corps, under the command of Ambrose Burnside, former commander of the Army of the Potomac, had noticed early on their close placement to the rebel works, which sat only a hundred yards away from their trenches. General Robert Potter had noted their close placement to a key section of the newly dug Confederate works, in an area known as Elliott's Salient. Lieutenant Colonel Henry Pleasance, commander of the 48th Pennsylvania, had also noticed the close proximity to the Confederate works. Both men conferred with one another about the feasibility of undermining the works, a task that Pleasance knew was doable. He, along with many of the men of the 40th Pennsylvania, were from Schuylkill County, Pennsylvania, a region well known for its coal mining industry, which many of the men had participated in prior to their enlistment. The ambitious plan to undermine the Confederate works and detonate a mine below them was proposed to Burnside, who approved of the action. Before long, the men of the 48th Pennsylvania had set about doing the long, grueling task of digging the tunnel below the works. Colonel Pleasance chose Sergeant Henry Reese, a former coal miner from Minersville, Pennsylvania, to be in charge of the operation. During the duration of the digging, Reese would sit out in front of the entrance into the shaft, supervising the entry and exit of every single man into and out of the tunnel. Military convention of the time had outlined that the tunnel length required to reach the rebel works at Elliott Salient, over 400 feet long, would not be possible due to the prevalent issue of supplying fresh air into the tunnel shaft. However, the resourceful men of the 48th Pennsylvania had figured out a solution. About 100 feet into the tunnel, the men had dug a vertical ventilation shaft, there, a fire was lit, which would draw air into the tunnel. The entrance of the tunnel was sealed off with a burlap partition, which blocked air from entering, except through a specifically constructed ventilation duct made out of wood, which would help siphon air through the tunnel and towards the end, where it would then be drawn back towards the fire and out of the tunnel. The system worked well enough to enable the men to continue digging, extending the tunnel's length to well over 400 feet long before it branched out into two sections. The Confederates, however, had become aware of the mining operation taking place along Elliott's salient. In response, they had dug their own countermines, attempting to locate the Union mine as best as possible. However, these countermines did not burrow deep enough into the earth, reaching a maximum of ten feet deep, with probing bars only reaching a further five feet down into the soil. The Union mine was twenty feet below the surface, meaning their operations were safe as the mine finished its completion in late July 1864. Though the tunnel had been a success, in spite of the limited resources provided by Meade in high command, the planning for the subsequent assault was marred with internal army politics and personal vendettas. 
Burnside had proposed the plan to General George Meade, commander of the Army of the Potomac. Meade, often known as the Snapping Turtle due to his quick temper, initially disregarded Burnside's plans, with his chief engineer, James Duane, not providing any of the resources required to conduct the digging operations. By mid-July, Burnside had already begun making the necessary preparations to conduct the assault. He tasked General Edward Ferrero's 4th Division to open the assault. Ferrero's division consisted entirely of the newly raised United States Colored Troops, men who had not seen any form of combat, having been relegated to conducting logistics roles for the Ninth Corps and the rest of the Army of the Potomac throughout the Overland Campaign. However, Burnside's 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Divisions had been worn out by the constant strain of trench warfare after all three divisions had suffered considerably during the Second Battle of Petersburg, leaving only the 4th Division as fresh troops for an assault. Burnside's plan called for the 4th Division to split into two wings when approaching the newly formed crater. One wing would swing to the left, while the other wing would swing to the right. This would be done in order to counter any potential resistance in the aftermath of the mine detonation. From there, the rest of Burnside's corps would move forward and advance beyond Elliott's salient. By mid-July, Ferrero's colored troops would focus on drilling for the complex maneuvers required to successfully conduct the assault. On July 26th, the construction of the galleries had been completed and were prepared for the explosives to be placed. Though Burnside had requested over six tons of black powder be furnished for the mine detonation, the Ninth Corps only received four tons. General Pleasance had requested 100-foot-long fuse lines, but it had been instead furnished with 10-foot-long fuses, causing further complications with preparing the mine. In spite of these setbacks, the mine had been primed and ready by the 28th of July, 1864. However, more setbacks would occur on July 29th, 1864, the day before the assault was scheduled to begin. Around noon on the 29th, Burnside called for the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Divisional Commanders to meet with him. General Robert Potter of the 2nd Division and General Orlando Wilcox of the 3rd Division had arrived on time for the meeting, but General James Ledley of the 1st Division didn't arrive until after Burnside had begun his Council of War. The three men hadn't been briefed up to this point, as Burnside's proposed plan still called for the 4th Division to lead the assault, a proposal that was still awaiting approval by Ulysses S. Grant. However, as the meeting was underway, Burnside's war council had been disrupted by George Meade, who reported that Grant, much as Meade had expressed earlier, did not approve of the usage of the United States Colored Troops for the assault due to them being untried and for any potential political fallout if the regiment was slaughtered, a sentiment Meade himself expressed to Grant. With this news... Burnside's plans were thrown out the window. After hours of debate with his subordinate brigadier generals without any proper consensus on who should lead the assault, Burnside decided to have his three divisional commanders draw lots, with James Ledley drawing the odd lot out. However, unknown to Burnside, Ledley was one of the worst men for the job. Though Burnside... Potter and Wilcox were unaware, many of Ledley's subordinates knew about his sheer level of incompetence. Prior to the siege, Ledley had been known to hide away from the battlefield and would drink heavily, often being intoxicated while his men were fighting on the field. As a result of the lack of a commander for the division, the 1st Division ended up doing poorly during the Battle of North Anna and during the 2nd Battle of Petersburg. Ledley's 1st Division would now lead the assault, driving through the newly formed opening and advancing towards the hill where Blanford Cemetery resided, a location Burnside would call Cemetery Hill. Wilcox would swing to the left of Ledley's assault, while Potter would swing to the right, both divisions blocking any potential Confederate counterattacks. 
Ferrero's 4th Division would then bring up the rear with the colored troops. The stage was set for a climatic battle, a battle that would end up morphing from a potential war-winning fight into a bloodbath for Burnside's 9th Corps. At 3 a.m. on July 30th, 1864, Sergeant Reese, accompanied by Lieutenant Jacob Doughty, would light the fuse and would finally detonate the four tons of black powder below the Confederate lines. It was planned for the mine to detonate at 3.30 a.m. However, 3.30 a.m. came and went without any detonation. The minutes ticked by until, finally, at 4.15 a.m., Reese and Doughty went back down into the tunnel, locating what went wrong. The fuse had gone out at a splice where the short fuses had been bound together, which required for Reese to cut it and relight it again. Both men would dash out of the tunnel when, finally, at 4.29 a.m., the mine detonated. From Burnside's headquarters, a dull thud could be heard. However, from the Federal trenches less than 500 feet away, the explosion was a sight to behold. The ground was torn asunder as a mix of dirt, wooden timbers, and human limbs were thrown into the sky before raining back down upon the Confederate and Union positions. Two of the four guns of Pegram's battery were destroyed one of the Napoleons being flung from its position before falling back to earth. As soon as the debris finished raining down, the first division began their assault. However, their commander, James Ledley, had not remained long with his men. He soon withdrew behind the Union lines, hiding out in a bomb-proof with a bottle of alcohol he had acquired through the medical staff, claiming he had been injured. The first division, without its commander, drove forwards towards the newly formed crater. However, as they approached, a horrific sight awaited them in the pit. Men were partially or totally buried underneath tons of dirt and clay kicked up by the massive explosion, the dead lying with those barely clinging to life. Confronted with such a horrific sight, many of the men of the first division descended down into the crater and began to rescue their buried foes. Before long, all cohesion had been lost. Meanwhile, from Cemetery Hill and the high ground to the north and south of the crater, the Confederate artillery began to open fire into the pit and the surrounding breastworks. All the while, the shattered remnants of General Stephen Elliott's brigade began to collect themselves. The explosion, by itself, had killed an estimated 278 men, hitting the 17th, 18th, and 22nd South Carolina Infantry Regiments hard. Company B of the 22nd South Carolina had three dozen men among its ranks before the battle, but after the explosion, only five men survived most being buried alive or being killed instantly by the tremendous explosion. However, the remnants of Elliott's brigade had rallied and began to place stiff resistance against the Federals of the Ninth Corps. Shortly thereafter, Potter's 2nd Division and Wilcox's 3rd Division made their advance. However, the battle plan for them would go awry, as their attempt to cover the 1st Division saw elements of the 2nd Division drift towards the left instead of covering the right, many of whom ended up in the crater with the 1st Division. However, in spite of these impediments, they had made some progress, slowly driving back the shattered remnants of Elliott's South Carolinians, but at the cost of cohesion. The three divisions had been funneled into a narrow space, resulting in most of the cohesion of the forces breaking apart in the maddening chaos of the crater. Just as Lee was about to sit down and eat breakfast, reports came in about the ensuing assault on Elliot's salient. 
Immediately, he dispatched one of his staff officers to go directly to Brigadier General William Mahone and inform him of the situation. Mahone, a native of the city of Petersburg, had worked on establishing the Petersburg Norfolk Railroad, which ran through the federal lines towards their rear. He knew the train well, and, being the closest commander in the area, would be able to respond rapidly to the developing situation. When word reached Mahone, he immediately dispatched two of his brigades under his command, Weisinger's Virginia Brigade and Wright's Georgia Brigade, to plug the gap, though leaving the northern flank critically undermanned. Mahone would personally scout the situation out, taking a covered way crossing through Cemetery Hill. Upon seeing the developing situation, Mahone called for a third brigade to be moved immediately towards the ensuing battle. Help for Elliot's battered men was on the way and less than two miles from his position, marching as swiftly as possible. Meanwhile, with the assault faltering, Burnside finally ordered for Ferrero's 4th Division to conduct their assault. The colored troops advanced forward through the three white divisions in front of them, shouting, Remember Fort Pillow, no quarter! as their war cry. The appearance of the colored troops and their declaration of giving no quarter infuriated the defending South Carolinians, who continued their desperate hold against the tidal wave of blue-clad black men. Towards their rear, Weisinger's Virginia Brigade, consisting of the 6th, 12th, 16th, 41st, and 61st Virginia Regiments, took up the center while Wright's Georgia Brigade, under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Matthew R. Hall, took up the Confederate left. Word quickly filtered to Weisinger's Virginia Brigade about the United States Colored Troops and their proclamation of giving no quarter, which inspired deep disdain for their enemies. Many of the men of Weisinger's Brigade, especially the men of the 12th Virginia, were citizens of the city of Petersburg, their homes less than a mile away from the ensuing battle before them. All the while, the United States Colored Troops continued their march forward, pushing through the rest of the Ninth Corps, advancing towards the newly formed Confederate battle line. Mahone gave the order for Weisinger's Virginians to move forward. One of Weisinger's staff officers shouted, Forward! Charge! Without a moment's hesitation, the whole brigade advanced forwards, letting out the rebel yell as they crested the ridge. The colored troops, who moments earlier had seemed like an unstoppable wave, were stopped dead in their tracks and soon began to flee at the sight of the gray-clad wall of Virginians, filled with indignant rage as they came within the Confederate works. There, they let loose a volley into the mass of Federal troops before surging forwards and engaging in brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat. Panic soon filled the disorganized Ninth Corps as the fleeing men of the 4th Division crashed back into the still disorganized units of the 2nd and 3rd Divisions. Many of the Virginians, filled with frightening fury, showed no quarter to many of the colored troops who, less than an hour earlier, had triumphantly shouted no quarter themselves. During the fighting, Weisinger was gravely wounded and limped his way to the nearby G House, where General P.G.T. Beauregard and General Bushra Johnston, commander of the forces along Elliott Salient, had made their temporary headquarters. All the while, the Union forces began their withdrawal away from the Confederate works and back into the crater. And it was here that Major John C. Haskell brought up his artillery and began a rain of fiery hell upon the Federals, now trapped in the crater. Captain William Gordon McCabe later wrote down the horrors that were soon to follow. And now, the scene within the horrid pit was such as might be fitly portrayed only by the pencil of Dante after he had trod nine-circled hell. From the great mortars to the right and left, 
huge missiles, describing graceful curves, fell at regular intervals with dreadful accuracy and burst among the helpless masses huddled together, and every explosion was followed by piteous cries, and oftentimes the very air seemed darkened by flying human limbs. Haskell, too, had moved up his epaulette mortars among the men of the 16th Virginia, so close, indeed, that his powder charge was but one ounce and a half. And, without intermission, the storm of fire beat upon the hapless men imprisoned within. The battle had slowly morphed into a horrific bloodbath, as thousands of men were crowded within the walls of the crater, desperately holding on as the Confederates unleashed their fearsome barrage upon them. Yet, Meade had insisted for Burnside to attempt to hold the crater in the hope of incorporating it into their defenses. However, even this tiny glimmer of hope would be shattered in the most horrific manner possible. Colonel John C. C. Saunders's brigade of Alabamians had made it to the field, which Mahone tasked with finally driving the enemy out of the horrid pit. Mahone reminded the men that there were colored troops who had shouted that they would give no quarter to them, inspiring indignant rage among the seasoned Alabamians. The shelling continued until the Alabamians crested over the ridge of the newly formed pit. Soon, a sight of true horror erupted as the Alabamians swarmed into the pit, brutally fighting and killing countless scores of men. Even though the Alabamians were drastically outnumbered, Burnside's Ninth Corps was completely demoralized, and soon a tidal wave of blue-clad men swept over the makeshift beginnings of a covered way and out of the horrid pit. All the while, the Alabamians continued to relentlessly kill the remaining defenders in the pit, showing little mercy to the colored troops as they went. Finally, Adjunct Morgan Cleveland of the 8th Alabama shouted, "'Why in the hell don't you fellows surrender? Why in the hell don't you let us?' shouted a Union colonel still trapped in the pit. At noon, on July 30th, 1864, a makeshift white flag was raised by the remaining Union troops. After eight hours of bitter fighting, the battle was finally over. The Confederates had won one of the most horrific battles of the war. By the end of the battle, the total casualties suffered by the Union forces engaged at the crater mounted to nearly 3,800 men killed, wounded, or missing. The Confederates suffered a grand total of 1,612 men killed, wounded, or missing. In the end, the Ninth Corps saw a 20% casualty ratio overall, with the 4th Division receiving nearly twice the number of casualties as the other three divisions. The battle, which should have been a sweeping victory for the Union, became one of the most devastating defeats of the Army of the Potomac, gaining them nothing in turn. To this day, the land outside of Petersburg bears the scar of the horrid pit a permanent scar to remind us all of the horrors of war, forever hollowed by northern and southern blood. <laughs>